afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Please come in and be seated. I'm Ben Bottle, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech. Thank you all for joining us today for our second and final 10th anniversary special public lecture series featuring Nobel laureates this semester. We're very fortunate to have 2002 Nobel laureate Vernon Smith here back in January, and are equally fortunate and honored that 2004 co recipient Fitty Kidlin is with us tonight, who I will introduce shortly. Uh, I mentioned that this is our final public lecture of the semester, although it is not our final public event of the semester. Coming up a week from Thursday, we have our 10th anniversary golf tournament, which does still have openings for a few courses. If you're interested in playing, we need you to register by Thursday. There are little information cards out there at the table with a QR code where you can scan it and register if you would like to join us. Before I go on and introduce our speaker, and I already spoke a little bit about our 10th anniversary before, so I'll be very brief now and say it's just been a great pleasure and an honor to be able to do this for the last 10 years. I'm grateful to the faculty I work with, our staff, the students at the Free Market Institute and throughout the university, of course, and in particular the community for coming out to our event. And I couldn't imagine a better university than Texas Tech to be doing this at, where the administration has been so supportive of our efforts. And in, uh, related to that, I would like to introduce our provost, uh, Provost Ron Hendrick, to come up and say just a few words. Provost Hendrick. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for being here tonight. It's a great turnout. Um, and I think deservedly so. This, uh, Two lectures here, um, I think, are very um, emblematic of the, the great work that is done here within the Institute. And um, it's a great year for us to be celebrating this 10 year anniversary. Um, Dr. Kidlin and Tanya, welcome. We appreciate you joining us here in Lubbock. Um, I think, as most of you know, the New Market Institute advances research and teaching here at Texas Tech, um, fundamentally related to the free enterprise system. It is, a, I think, a unique um, and signature part of what we do here at Texas Tech, promoting uh, disciplinary, cross-disciplinary scholarship um, and providing forums like these and others to encourage discussion as well as rigorous debate regarding all aspects of free markets. As a bit of a system scientist myself, I appreciate the FMI systematic approach to how they join diverse parts and different parts of this university in a comprehensive effort to better understand and explain the societal benefits of market exchange, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Now in this tenth year, FMI scholars have published a dozen, a dozen books, offered nearly, offered nearly 300 research publications, nine faculty members teaching more than 6,300 contact hours to students across this last decade. It is a diverse faculty in terms of their scholarship joint appointments in three colleges here at Texas Tech, connections with things like the Department of Philosophy, our Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, a sibling institution across the way, and two faculty members who have joint appointments with Arizona State University. It's not my job to introduce Dr. Kimball, so I will pass on that, but I want to welcome you again uh, here to love it. Thank you, Provost Hendrick. It's my honor and privilege to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. Professor Finn Kidman is the Jeff Henley Chair in Economics at UC Santa Barbara, where he is also the Director of the Laboratory for Aggregate Economics and Finance, LAFE, which I learned at lunch today. He picked the name intentionally so he could get an acronym that would sound like LAFE Erickson, the first Norwegian to discover North America. Uh, he had previously taught at Carnegie Mellon, where he earned his PhD. And it might not surprise you now learn that he's a native of Norway, uh, where he earned his bachelor's degree from the Norwegian School of Economics and Business Administration, and also held his first faculty appointment after earning his PhD. He was also briefly a professor at another university here in Texas that, for the purposes of this introduction, will remain nameless for his uh, But we appreciate him coming up to Texas Tech after having worked there. Uh, Professor Kidman won the 2004 Nobel Prize jointly with the late Ed 
Prescott, who by the way also spoke in our lecture series back in 2019. They won the award for their contributions to dynamic macroeconomics, the time, consistency of economic policy, and the driving forces behind business cycles. Professor Kidman has published more than 50 papers, generating many thousands of citations. He is a research associate at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and has been a visiting professor at universities in six different countries. His honors and awards include the John Stauffer National Fellowship in Public Policy from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and he's been a named fellow of the Econometric Society since 1992. Please join me in welcoming Professor Pitt Kidman to Texas Tech. Uh, representing Hong Kong. Uh, I, I suppose 
knows, if you know something about Hong Kong, uh, you, you may feel some uh, 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 happiness about their situation because they, they like uh, the uh, like uh, the, the free market institute, uh, they have been uh, forerunners in terms of allowing for competitive activity. Uh, now, so, so as I said, I have uh, those three uh, Latin American countries. This is the saddest picture on my uh, slides uh, because uh, here, here we have the real GDP per capita again for a number of sub-Saharan African countries. And if you look towards the bottom, I mean the, the, the yellow curve is Democratic Republic of Congo. If there were ever a ridiculous name for a country, that would be uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Not, turns out to be not very democratic. Uh, and then, uh, then, toward, then towards the bottom uh, are uh, Liberia and, and uh, a bunch of countries. Now, what, uh, what I would like to take away from this is how low a per capita income or per capita uh, real GDP is in, in these countries. Uh, the exception, of course, and that's the reason I had to expand the scale. The scale here goes from uh, zero to ten thousand dollars per uh, per capita. And the only reason I need to do up to ten thousand is because. There is a country in Africa which has been very successful in managing their resources. It's a resource-rich country. They have uh, lots of minerals, including diamonds and so on. And uh, so this is Botswana. And they have also been reasonably successful in, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, democracy of, of their nation. Uh, now, so an economist cannot talk for very long without using some theory. So, uh, theory is what we all uh, we are all about, uh, and, and we believe that that's why we make progress the way we do in terms of understanding nations. So here, here's my one slide that I would classify as a theory slide. And it says that GDP, which is the sum of everything produced in a nation, the sum of consumption goods, investment goods, government purchases, and so on, the sum of all goods what's included in gross domestic product, GDP, is a function of three things. Uh, now the, uh, towards the end it says, function of capital and labor inputs. Uh, labor, you understand that's more or less proportional to the population, it grows, it, it grows a little faster than the population because uh, what we're interested in is uh, 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 quality adjusted uh, education. And that, that, that depends on uh, the education level in, in, in the nations and so on. Uh, capital, you, I guess you understand that's the, uh, that's the sum of all the factories and machines in the, in the nation. Uh, and that's, 
a very important aspect because in part that's where so so you, you heard the, the title of uh, what I got the prize for on the type inconsistency of optimal government policy and uh, capital is a candidate for being the source of time inconsistency in other words uh, businesses have incentives to build capital, but then when the factories are finished, there is this temptation to uh, renege on uh, on the, those factories and uh, and say, "Sorry, uh, uh, we will you we, uh, we, we, will, we will as a government take the income." From those factories. Now, you, you'll see an example of uh, how important that is in a, in a slightly different context. But what I especially want to mention is, is a Z. So, Z uh, is what we call the technology level. So, that's a sum of, of all uh, of research and development. Uh, development of new products, etc. In, in a nation. And this Z is a very powerful thing because it's notice that it's linear, uh, uh, this function is linear in Z. Uh, because of the linearity that makes it extremely powerful because for every 1% increase in Z, it represents, it automatically translates into a 1% increase in GDP. Uh, and so, uh, in a little while, I will emphasize how important the, the Z is. Uh, I'll show you some measurements. Um, but now, let, let me let me turn to a to a. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on a uh, well. Uh, first, let me say this: this uh, is a collection of like like the picture of uh, USA, Canada, and uh, and Australia. This most of this picture, those stipes, uh, is it called stipes? Stipe lines. There, there are a number of uh, their GDP. Real GDP per capita for a number of European countries. Uh, the, at the bottom, you can see Greece, which did very poorly for uh, quite a while. Uh, but most of the European countries are doing okay. Uh, so. Now I would like to turn my attention to uh, to uh, uh, some uh, three or four more European countries, and uh, let me explain uh, what what's in these pictures. So, so these are Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Ireland. Ireland is going to be the country on which I focus the most, but uh, let's just see what these pictures say. Uh, if, if you look at the first 30 years of each of these pictures, from uh, 1960 to, to 1990, you can see there, there is an upward trend. Uh, the the uh, slope of that trend it is a me measure of the rate of growth according to that straight line. So uh, the straight line represents constant rate of growth. And as you can see in the first 30 years in, in, in these pictures, the, um, uh, the growth in, in all, all these three countries was acceptable, I would say. Uh, but then, uh, starting uh, in uh, 1990, in the 
last few years, in, in the last uh, 30 or so years in the picture, they came to a full stop. Growth came to a full stop in all three countries. And that's bad for any nation for that to happen. Uh, I'll say a little more about the reasons for for coming to a full stop. But this this is to try to understand what, what has happened in Spain, Italy, and Portugal has been uh, a subject of uh, one of my favorite research research projects. Um, it's a research project I've, uh, I've been involved in for, for, for uh, a, a few decades with a, an economist uh, at, at, the, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Uh, his name is Enrique Martinez Garcia. Uh, as I said, my favorite research topic, topic and I, I, I'm so convinced of the potential success of that project. Uh, a few weeks ago, I invited Enrique to come to Santa Barbara so that we can make sure we will finish this paper. Uh, and uh, uh, on top of that, I invited his girlfriend to come as well to uh, try to ensure that we will be working hard on, on that paper. And, and uh, that, I'm convinced that's going to be a great paper and uh, it provides an understanding of why these countries came to a full stop in February 1990. Uh, now, so, So the, um, the, these pictures, uh, they give, uh, they, um, they indicate what I call the total factor productivity index. So, so that's another name of oh, that's uh, more commonly used as a name for uh, uh, for the Z in my uh, slide, uh, my theory slide. So the Z, I, uh, I, should, I could have called total factor productivity. And uh, I already indicated to you why the Z is so important, the proportionality of it, how it enters the function on the right hand side, and so on. Uh, extremely important for why nations grow in the long run. Uh, but notice I've included another country, Ireland. And Ireland, um, so Ireland is interesting because they decided in, in after the country hadn't done so well up until about 1990, uh, it's, it's a well-educated country. I mean, the education level is high. Uh, uh, the, the number of uh, uh, high school students and, and college students and so on, uh, large, large number of them. So it's a, it could be regarded as a puzzle why Ireland weren't, weren't doing better so Ireland decided, or well, the government decided in around 1990, they said, if you, whether you're a foreign or domestic company, if you set up shop in Ireland, this will be your tax rates, not just next year, 1992, 93, and so on, but for the next 12 or 15 years. And this, this had an amazing effect. So Ireland started to, to, to grow, and within uh, about 
12 or 15 years, GDP per capita in Ireland had just about doubled. Um, spectacular success. Uh, something that uh, I don't know why other countries couldn't, couldn't copy that, but uh, one, one of the uh, issues related to Ireland is you, you may wonder why, how, how is that credible? Uh, how, did, how would people believe that they would stick to, to uh, this policy and then they wouldn't turn around and say, oh, we fooled you, uh, we, we are going to catch you uh, uh, at, at high rates from now on. So evidently, Ireland has a great deal of uh, they enjoys a great deal of confidence in the rest, rest of the world. Uh, to me, uh, this decision by Ireland is a good example, the best example I know of, uh, of something that Prescott and I realized when, when we did our work, how it's important to have a commitment mechanism, a way to commit yourself to good economic policy. And this is especially important in the arena of capital income taxation, but also generally. Uh, so, uh, so Ireland's success I regard as, as an example of how a country could commit itself to great economic policy for the long run. And one thing uh, economists, especially in aggregate economics, which is my field, uh, understand, it's the long run that matters. It's, it's not so important what happens with the small wheels uh, in the short run, it's the long run that really matters. Uh, so, uh, this is how uh, the, uh, the total factor and productivity pictures translate into something we may be more interested in. Uh, the quantity of GDP per hour work. So that gives uh, us a, a sense of the productivity of, uh, of people in the nation. How much how much consumption goods, how much investment goods, and so on, how much do they produce per hour they work. That's an that's important measure of a uh, nation's productivity. And in these pictures, you see the total factor of productivity pretty much translated into GDP per hour work. Now, so, so I would like to, to talk about something that I, Enrique and I discovered in, in our research project. And that is, and it's something that any, I, I think any, um, I'm sure the free market institute will, uh, will take that to heart. Uh, when we went to uh, um, to Oslo for the Mont Pelerin Society, where uh, Ben uh, first heard me speak, and I guess that's why he wanted me to come to uh, to uh, Lubbock. Um, they, they are also very much interested in uh, in what what government governments free market. Uh, policy. So now, one one of the one of the interesting things Enrique and I realized was uh, 
So if we, if we look across um, industries in a nation, uh, you can classify industries in two ways. Um, one way is industries producing goods that are tradable. So tradable goods can be traded with uh, other nations, with other industries perhaps, also within the Spain itself, they can be traded. Uh, tr tradable goods have the characteristic that there's a lot of competition. So uh, uh, competition is a great thing for making economies more productive. Uh, so so I, I have a... And then, uh, but what was astounding about this picture was that the nominal value of, of, of uh, goods produced that we can classify as produced in tradable goods economies. They used to be about half and half. Half of the uh, goods were in tradable goods economies, half in non-tradable goods economies. Now what's astounding in this picture is that a number of uh, decades later, they used to be about half and half, as I said. Uh, a few decades later, they're, they're about two-thirds non-tradable goods and one-third tradable goods. That's very bad because uh, it's the tradable goods that are that face a lot of competition. That's where you're likely to see the greatest increases in uh, productivity. Um, I sometimes talk about Latin America as a bad example. And so Argentina, for example, there, they, um, they have this great potential. There are, there are the Pampas, the uh, vast areas where they can gross stuff. But, but they, they also tend to put in place restrictions on what can be imported, what can be exported, and that's a bad thing for a country. It's something that cuts down on the extent of competition in, in, the, in the respective nations and, and so on. So now I, I do, in case you wonder, what, what, are, what are examples of non-tradable versus tradable goods? And uh, I, I do have a list uh, where it says T, T's and F's, uh, tradable goods and uh, T's and M's. Uh, I, in that list, I, I looked at some examples. And I counted the, the number of uh, tradable goods versus uh, non-tradable industries on, on this list. Turns out there are nine of each. There are nine uh, industries that are tradable, nine industries that are non-tradable. And just to take uh, examples of tradable uh, goods industries, agriculture, fishing, manufacturing, Mining, and, and then uh, on the non-trade, we have accommodations, food service, um, and uh, so, so, so so it's pretty. 
pretty clear that it's the competition, the competition across industries or uh, between industries, similar industries in, uh, let's say, in Spain, uh, competition between industries in, in, within Spain, uh, Portugal and Italy that play a big role in either making them more competitive, more productive, or not. Uh, so I, I already uh, mentioned the the uh, the uh, Argentine example, uh, which to me is a, is a is a is an example where uh, because of the uh, government putting in restrictions on. Uh, especially on imports and exports of other goods. It may, means that there's less competition uh, across industries in Argentina. Actually, it could be in Chile, it could be... Uh, so Chile, is, is an, to me, is, is an example of a country that uh, has behaved reasonably. Uh, they, they, um, at some point, the bank banking system in Chile was in uh, big trouble. The uh, uh, banks in Chile were insolvent. Uh, and what Chile decided to do was um, to um, privatize the banking system in Chile. Uh, a big contrast between Chile and, and another example of a Latin American country, Mexico. A big contrast between Chile and Mexico is that so, so this is what Chile did to shore up their banking system to privatize their banks and then meant that uh, interest rates were uh, quoted, uh, people could make their decisions based on whether the interest rates were higher or lower and so on and made for more efficient uh, economy. The contrast between there's a contrast between Chile and another Latin American country, Mexico. So in, in Mexico, they did not, they decided not to privatize the banks. Uh, instead, bureaucrats took over the banking system of Mexico. So bureaucrats would be in charge and they would say, well, you may get a loan, but you won't get a loan. Well, you can imagine that is not conducive to uh, to competition uh, within the country. And so, as a consequence, Mexico, uh, while while Chile grew by maybe uh, twenty or thirty percent over a uh, thirty-year period. Since uh, about 1980, uh, Mexico stagnated. They they uh, uh, 30 years later, GDP per capita in Mexico was about the, at the same level they started uh, around 1980. So uh, to me, this is a uh, a great example, both of how one can structure, uh, for example, banking system, but most importantly, how important competition is for the potential future productivity of a nation, and that's what translates into the Z in in uh, my.
equation and I already indicated how important that Z is for the growth of nations. Uh, let me just finish uh, doing one more thing and, and then this a look. So here I want you to look only at the blue curve. Uh, the other two curves are curves that Enrique and I have, uh, you know, we need it for our work, but, but what's relevant here is are the, the blue curves. Oh, in this case, the blue curve, and this is output per hour work in the trade movement sector uh, of, uh, of Spain. And notice it starts about 1980, it's at an index of about uh, 100. By 2010, it has reached a level of about of, of over 200, so it had more than doubled in over that, those number of years. So that's the uh, output per hour work in the trade of goods sector. If I turn to the uh, non-tradable goods sector, again, uh, we will start with an index that we set at uh, 100 in 1980, and then see how fast we grew. And by uh, 2010, only, only, it's grown only from 100 to 120, only 20% 20 uh, growth. Uh, I, I, I could translate that to per year uh, levels. So uh, for the for the trade movement sector, it turned out to be and between two and a quarter to two and a half percent per year. In the, in the non-trade movement sector, that means that output per uh, hour work grew only about one third percent per year. Uh, much, much more slowly and uh, much less desirable. Anyway, so uh, uh, I, I suppose my main messages come from uh, my study of uh, Ireland. So Ireland um, made tax policy certain for about 15 years. They said, if you uh, set up shop in Ireland, these would be your tax rates. Not just uh, in, in 90, 1992, 1993, and so on, but all the way to about 2005. Uh, they made tax policy certain. And I suppose you may wonder uh, why would they? Why would anyone trust that? Well, I, I guess uh, Ireland has, does not have a history of tricking people, and so uh, I suppose that kind of helps to uh, make the commitment trustworthy. So, so, so that is an example of a commitment mechanism, something that Prescott and I realized was an important thing to go along with reasonable economic policy, uh, a kind of commitment mechanism, especially in the arena of uh, capital accumulation, so that uh, investors would not be worried that you know one, once they once they went ahead and uh, built factories and machines, that uh, the government would then turn around and tax those factories more heavily. Uh, so, so Ireland to me is the most important example of a 
country with a, that successfully came up with a commitment mechanism. Whether any country can do so well, I, I sometimes wonder. You saw the uh, depressing pictures from Sub-Saharan Africa. We had a conference at my center, and uh, I, I, I once asked one of the experts uh, at, at that conference, "Do you think technology can be can be exported?" to uh, countries such as Sub-Saharan and Africa. Um, the expert was not so sure about that. And, uh, but I think that's something to think about. How, how can, is there a way to, to make technology exportable, to make the Zen exportable? to countries such as Africa, because it, it is sad to see how low their uh, income per capita is, and if we could make your life better for, obviously there are millions of people in Sub-Saharan Africa, that would be a great benefit for humanity. So, I will stop here. Thank you very much for having listened.